Uh, Peanuts started with a man named Charles Schultz, who was born in Minneapolis, Minnesota in 1922. Charles Schultz uh, had the nickname Sparky, which was after another cartoon character, which was in the Barney Google uh, comic strip. There was a character named Sparkplug. And so they called him Sparky. Here he is when he served this country. His very first published cartoon was actually uh, in Ripley's Believe It or Nots. He wrote in to Ripley's Believe It or Nots, and he wrote in about his dog, drawn by Sparky, and it said that uh, he owned a dog named Spike who had an unusual appetite and would, would eat pins, tacks, razor blades, and more, and uh, was owned by Charles Schultz. And so he drew this little cartoon. It appeared in the newspaper. This was when he was still a little boy. 1937. Since then, they've been able to locate the original letter. Hold on. Hold on. Uh, they were able to locate the original letter that he sent to Robert Ripley. And here it is. And here's actually a picture of his dad with the dog. And it says that, uh, dear Mr. Ripley, I have this hunting dog. It eats, uh, among the things that we already heard, it eats a high lie ball, handkerchiefs, stockings, pins, tacks, screws, and razor blades. Um, and then it says here at the bottom, all of these things have been swallowed whole and digested. Now I looked this up. Digested means that to break down food in the elementary canal into substances that can be absorbed and used in the body. So this dog had an amazing, amazing appetite. Um, so that was, his, that was his first published cartoon. Like there you can see, digest, a verb. Um, so he then got a job actually doing cartoons. He did lettering for a Roman Catholic comic magazine called Timeless Topics. He would letter the whole magazine in French, Spanish, and English for just a buck 50 an hour. Um, this is one of the comics he drew and you can see this is signed by Sparky, keep them laughing. And you can see these ants here and it says, uh, go ahead and jump, it's just a drop in the bucket. Uh, Charles Schultz then started Little Folks, which was a, uh, a comic strip, and that led to Peanuts. And so right now, with no further ado, I want you guys to give a big Louisville welcome to the voice of your char childhood, the voice of Charlie Brown, Peter Robbins. Peter, come on up here. So happy to see you. Thank you, Guy. <clears throat> so people ask me, can I do the voice of Charlie Brown? Now you gotta remember, Charlie Brown's lines were, good grief, take one. Good grief, take two. <laughs> Ugh! <laughs> I'll tell you a little bit about uh, my experience in being the voice of Charlie Brown. I was a child actor. I went on a cattle call interview with also, let me take my nicotine gum away, Christopher Shea. We were handled by the same agent, Hazel McMillan, who handled only children. And they scrambled to get the voices of Charlie Brown and Linus. Lee Mendelson, the producer, went to his uh, high school, high school, middle school, and started auditioning for characters but they couldn't find a Linus, and they couldn't find the right Charlie Brown. So I got to be lucky, and I got to be the voice of Charlie Brown. But what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about today is how the character Charlie Brown saved my life. A year ago, I was in a level three prison 
in California, where I'd spent approximately four years and eight months for criminal threats because I'm bipolar and I had a bipolar episode. So they paroled me to a mental hospital where I finally got treated for my bipolar disorder. And if you know somebody that has bipolar disorder, and of course they made all the jokes of Charlie Brown going to Lucy, psychiatry, five cents. But this character, Charlie Brown, I got hundreds and hundreds of um, fan mail telling me that I would be a better person spiritually and morally through this experience of prison, which was just hellacious. So I am so humble and so thankful and respectful to the greatest fans in the world, the Charlie Brown fans, who got me through prison in my darkest times where I thought I would commit suicide, where I thought I could not handle it. And they said, keep your head up, Charlie Brown. You'll get through this. And I did, and I'm under the right medications now. And I am so thankful to have you people and others that are fans, not only of Charlie Brown, but are fans of Peter Robbins and my climb back from the abyss. I'm here, not easy, <laughs> I'm on parole. So the state of California has to approve my travel pass. And they do, and they drag their legs, and in the last minute they say, okay, Charlie Brown, you can go. Um, the other voices I'd like to speak a little bit about, Christopher Shea, who's no longer with us. Um, he's, of course, the voice of Linus. Right. And without that Abbott and Costello, without that um, beautiful combination of the great philosopher of Linus and Charlie Brown, who opens up with a Charlie Brown Christmas saying, there must be something wrong with me, Linus. And at some point in our lives, we ask that question. What is wrong with us? Charlie Brown was lucky enough to have a, a character named Linus that put things into perspective. Um, and in desperation when Charlie Brown asks, isn't there anyone who knows what the meaning of Christmas is all about? And the spotlight goes on Linus. And he says, and he quotes from the Bible, peace on earth, goodwill towards men. So I have been very lucky. As I said, I was a child actor. I was in F Troop and Gunsmoke and Rawhide and a bunch of shows. Uh, movies with Sonny and Cher and Shirley Jones and Carolyn Jones, who was with Morticia, mm -hmm. and some of the most uh, beautiful actors and actresses in the world. But nothing compares to my participation in the small way it was, because this is uh, the voices of uh, Chris Shea, the voices of... Um, um, Sally, the voices of Lucy, uh, children actually doing the voices rather than adults trying to become children. And that lends itself to the actual um, authenticity of what makes this, these two specials in my mind, uh, the greatest television specials ever created a Charlie Brown Christmas 
followed by It's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown, because it was the kids' voices being expertly directed by Bill Melendez, mm -hmm. who, as you know, directed um, many of the Walt Disney films and had a great mustache. I remember looking yeah, at his mustache. You can see him on the yeah. screen there. He had a great mustache with a great pipe smell. And I'm like going, hmm, interesting. And he was a genius. Uh, everybody involved was a genius. Of course, the wonderful music by Vince Guaraldi. I remember when I saw it in, um, I think it was December 8th or 9th, uh, 1965, and I'd watched it for the first time, and I had thought um, it was fantastic. It, it seemed like it lasted five minutes. But once again, I just want to reiterate that the fans of Charlie Brown, the fans of uh, people that have been uh, called a blockhead, who have been disenfranchised from this, um, um, I don't know, um, country, so to speak. I, I, I've lived through prison. I've lived through a mental hospital. And all through all that time, people showed me love and respect because I'm the voice of Charlie Brown, and I sincerely appreciate it, and I sincerely uh, appreciate you all coming here, and of course, I'll answer any questions you would like, or if Guy That's would good. like yeah. to direct it in any kind of way. I just wanna say. Thank you. It is I sincerely love you all, I, I really do. Thank you for coming by and, and coming you know, come by my booth, and yeah. if my manager or handler isn't looking, I'll sign you an autograph for you. <laughs> he, I got to tell you, this is, it's a wonderful success story, and I think it's an uplifting story, you know, that you're here. And I think there are a lot of people, we all go through all kinds of things, and I think it's inspirational to hear this, and it's so great that you're here with us, and I think it's wonderful to see you interact with everybody. Thank you. Um, if you have a question, you can put your hand up uh, and we'll, we'll get it and we'll talk about all that. I have pictures from all the different uh, programs you've done and so I wanna talk about all of the different stuff including Charlie Brown. So, you, uh, we can start with, uh, you did the Christmas one. What do you remember about getting cast in that? Do you have uh, any specific memories about knowing that that was coming up? Well, I grew up in Newport Beach, and since I had been a successful child actor, Christmas was a very special time um, to me. I was very spoiled, uh, so I couldn't understand the concept of why a nine-year-old boy would be depressed during, um, during Christmas. Um, I would like, uh, if I could, call someone up to the stage that started writing to me when I was first in jail and then in prison and after prison and to this day. And I would like to get his thoughts of Charlie Brown and his name is Tim Seidenstricker. Could you come up here, Tim? Hello everyone, my name's Tim and I live in St. Louis, Missouri. Speak in the mic, <clears throat> Tim, I'm coaching him. My name is Tim and I live in St. Louis, Missouri and um, I'm happy to be here with my buddy Peter. Um, We've never met before. This is the first time. Yeah. It is. So um, a few years back I um, started um, wanting to collect autographs and and things like that and the main reason I wanted to to do so is because uh, of this man right here and the legendary specials it's the great pumpkin Charlie Brown and a Charlie Brown Christmas I um, watched them as a, a child and um, they meant so much to me we kind of met through Facebook before the or, before your ordeal happened and when that did happen I wrote you and was very pleased to get a reply back very quickly. 
And um, I wasn't busy in prison. <laughs> and I so had plenty uh, of time in my cell. And so I, um, I was pleased to hear back, and um, you know I think that um, I can't imagine how tough that would be to go through what you went through. And so I immediately thought I just wanted to be encouraging. I wanted to send encouraging, encouraging notes, and I wanted to uh, just try to be one of the people that you mentioned that that you would indeed get through this, and that the world needs you. The world needs the original and, as I say, the best voice of Charlie Brown. I'm not sure how many actors play Charlie Brown, but none of them are even close to to you. You know, and I mean that sincerely. So th those specials, I remember a time um, no YouTube, um, no DVDs, and I actually didn't even have cable until I was 20 and I got my own apartment. I, I didn't have cable as a child. <clears throat> My, di my dad had always said that um, anytime he'd ever been anywhere where someone had cable, all people did is just click, 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 click. Yeah. And so uh, when the specials would come on live, that's when I was there right up front watching them. And they were so special to me. And now I have sons of my own who now they're actually getting older. I have a 13-year-old son, and we watched it from a, a child, from, from when he was a child. And I just think they're wonderful, magical specials that have never been done since and they really meant a lot to me and I'm just pleased that you're here today. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right guy, hit me with the hard question. All right. So in between the two very famous, the Christmas and the Halloween special, you did one called Charlie Brown All-Stars. Uh, do you have any memories about recording this one? None. <laughs> <laughs> it came out in June of 66. Uh, the Great Pumpkin was a couple months later. Was this one, I mean, at the time, was this one as well received as it is today? I mean, is it one that it stood out over the other special? Yeah, well, you know, uh, I'm kind of competitive, and uh, it's the great pumpkin, uh, that little Linus guy kind of took over. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, I'll tell you a story. I always loved um, Chris Shea and the voice of Linus. And Chris Shea never ever showed up for like the anniversary shows and I was told he was a recluse and I was told he lived in Eureka, California and I lived in San Diego and somebody called me up to do an interview and I said, do you have the number of Chris Shea? and he said, yeah but don't tell me anybody who gave it to you. So I called Chris Shea. I hadn't seen him in 40 years or 45 years or something like that. I said, it's Charlie Brown, Chris, Linus. Let's meet. I'd love to see you. And that is that photo mm -hmm. over there. Right here. Is that presented? Yeah, they can see it up there on the screen there. Now, this is where we're at. We decided to go to a Tom Petty concert at the Oracle Arena, Arena in Oakland. He went to the Embarcadero in San Francisco, not Oakland. So I'm calling him, and he goes, I'm on Ch -ch -ch Chestnut Street. And I went, what? Chestnut Street. So me and my friends got in a Lexus and went to Chestnut Street. And there were black people on every corner. Everything was chained up at houses with the cars on the grass, you know. And I said, uh, where are you in Chestnut Street? Because I'm right by the harbor. So my friend decides to say, well, he's not in Chestnut Street in Oakland. He's in Chestnut Street in San Francisco. That's quite a drive. So I said, stay put. 
we'll come get you. So there he is in the Embarcadero in San Francisco with $100 bills flying out of his pocket. And I go to him, I go, are you high on acid? And he goes, yeah. I said, well, we got a concert to go to. He had $10,000 in a plastic bag that I put into my hotel safe. And we went to go to the concert. And we immediately lost Chris Shea, only to see him being levitated by a bunch of hands onto the stage <laughs> with Tom Petty. We went after the concert, couldn't find him, went to the Oakland PD and said, listen, I'm the voice of Charlie Brown. We're looking for Linus. Have you seen him? <laughs> they didn't see him. We went back the next day, because the Coliseum where the baseball field is is right next to the Oracle Arena. And we went around again going, have you seen Linus? And they're looking at us like we're crazy. He goes, have you checked the hospitals? Oh, no. So I checked hospitals. So we decided to go back to um, San Francisco where his truck was. And he was there hanging out at a, um, you know, ca cafe outside, kind of like in this position. And I said... <laughs> He goes, that concert was excellent, dude. <laughs> so I gave him back his $10,000 in cash, uh, despite what my friends told me to do. <laughs> I said, I'm not going to rip off Linus. That's not going to happen. And I just said, uh, who watches you when I'm not around? <laughs> So I gave him the money. We were planned to go on a river trip on the American River a month later, and he passed away. And I was very sad because he was looking at saying, maybe we could do a stand-up comedy thing together. Maybe we could go to Comic-Cons together. And he goes, should I cut my hair? And I look at him and go, why? <laughs> <laughs> why? <laughs> that's, that's the way. So that's one of the last pictures of uh, Chris Shea and me. And um, it was a great loss. And, um, you know, God bless him. He, he is as much a part of being uh, responsible for the greatness of the Charlie Brown Christmas and the Great Pumpkin. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you worked with uh, with several char child actresses and actors in, on Charlie Brown. Was he the one you got along with the best? Right here? Yeah, absolutely. Now, that young girl is named Pamela Ferdin. She was the, the daughter of one of the Odd Couples uh, TV series. And she became... Um, a part of a Charlie Brown um, movie. She was in the movie, and we were in, this is a picture of us together in a TV series called the Blondie series, which lasted 13 weeks and was uh, gratefully canceled. But, <laughs> but um, Jim Backus was in it, you know, Mr. Magoo mm -hmm. and uh, Gilligan's Island, and a guy named uh, Will Hutchins who played Sugarfoot. And Pamela Anderson, Pamela Anderson, is that right? No, Pamela, Pamela Ferdin. <laughs> Pamela Ferdin. <laughs> Wrong TV show. <laughs> Pamela Ferdin, just a side note, is a felon as well. And what she did, right? Mm -hmm. she, uh, she uh, protested the bad handling of elephants 
So she strolled on over to the owner of Barnum and Bailey Circus or whatever and came with a cattle prod because that's how they get those elephants to move or go into the train or whatever. So uh, I guess her and me have that in common. Um, <laughs> we're both felons. And, um, but I don't know much about what, what she's doing nowadays. Well, she posted this on Facebook. She was wishing you well. It was a couple years back. Um, she mentioned what you just talked about. And she said, um, uh, quote, uh, Peter played Brother Alexander to my cookie on the series Blondie and Charlie Brown to my Lucy in the movies and on TV. We went to movie theater and department store promotional events together, guested on talk shows together, and had the pleasure of being co-nominees for a Grammy Award for the recording of A Boy Named Charlie Brown. She's, yeah. She also posted a couple other pictures you might like. This was uh, the West Coast premiere of A Boy Named Charlie Brown. Yes. Do you remember? Do you remember going to these events? Yes. I mean, that uh, must have been something. That was one of the first times that I actually signed autographs, and uh, the the boy to the left of me is uh, was the voice of Linus. Um, right. So this was the second voice of Linus. They had replaced Chris Shea. Well, they originally then uh, um, um, gave the part to his younger brother who had that same kind of lisp and such. And then he came, so he's probably the third Linus. Yeah, this is Glenn Gilger, who was, uh, who was this Linus, and uh, uh, she said that you went to theaters around the country and you also went to breakfast with the Easter Bunny where you signed autographs and ate pancakes. Sounds good. <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask you about some of the other other programs you did. George uh, Bishop show I signed out. Which one? Which one here? From that one. How about that one? This was Get Smart. So I got to play on Get Smart, <laughs> and look at my photo there. I'm like the world's cutest kid. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> No, so there's Siegfried, and there's uh, Don Adams. I'll tell you a story about Don Adams. You know, this was produced by Mel Brooks. And we had a, a Monday morning read-through at 10 a.m. And we're all sitting at this table, going to do the, re you know, the table read-through of the script, which is timed, so they get an idea of what... So, it's 10 o'clock, uh, no uh, Agent 86, um, <laughs> 11 o'clock comes by, 11.30 comes by, you know, Mel Brooks is running around like a fanatic going, where's Don Adams, where's Don Adams? And then he shows up with these dark sunglasses and a Bloody Mary, <laughs> and he says, let's read the script. <laughs> so we did. <laughs> you know, listen, I was on F Troop, too. And I don't know if any of you know the kind of history of F Troop. Yep. Um, there I am again. Show that, right? Yeah, they can see that. That's world's, the... world's cutest kids. I'm apparently looking at my mother's tits. <laughs> I don't understand that. <laughs> but, uh, you know. You played Joey. Easy come, easy go. <laughs> you played a kid named Joey on F Troop. Yeah, Joey. Well, I, I have no direct information about that, but uh, uh, these guys were partiers. Um, so this is... Uh, Larry Storch and... Um, um, who's that? I can't remember, but this is the Forrest other... Forrest Tucker. Forrest Tucker. Forrest Tucker. And then they had this young woman that was uh, barely 18. But, the, you know, the, these guys like to party and uh, they were flawless in, in, um, in, in working with them. So that's just, you know, I got to go to Get Smart and F Troop and the Munsters. Do you have anything? I do have the Munsters. Now that is one heck of a TV show to be on. Uh, you were on the episode Rockabye Munster in 1964. You played Elmer. Yeah, I, I don't know where they came up with these names. <laughs> Elmer. So the great thing, I, of course, I got to meet uh, Butch Patrick, mm -hmm. and of course, um, 
Olivia um, DiCarlo, I believe, and of course, uh, Mr. Munster. Um, Fred Gwynn. What? Fred Gwynn. Fred Gwynn, uh, who was uh, seven feet tall. What was that like to see him in person, though? I mean, in that makeup. That, that's an experience very few people got. Well, and they shot everything. Uh, this was the third episode in black and white. Mm -hmm. So all the sets were black and white. And then he came, and he was so big anyways, and then the big shoes. And yeah, they gave him lifts to make him monstrously tall. Yeah. You know, I have a question. Is anybody out here thinking about putting their children into show business? All right. <laughs> I wasn't going to tell you not to do it, because uh, it was a, a, a great experience for me. I want to go in that room. Yeah, I know. I was going to say what. <laughs> All uh, right. So does that, if anybody has a question, put your hand up. We have, uh, we have a lot more to cover, but I'm happy to stop for anything you guys want to know. Yes, right here. What's your name? Hi, right, what's up? I never worked with Charles Schultz. Uh, he approved the voices. Mm -hmm. I saw around um, the 10 year anniversary of a Charlie Brown Christmas. I got to meet him in Santa Rosa. He's a very shy, quiet man. And um, he was very nice to me. Uh, but uh, the nuts and bolts of that was um, being directed by Bill Melendez. Yeah. Is is this uh, is this you with Charles Schultz here? Yes, that was in in Santa Rosa. And that's Sally Dyer, Dreyer. Sally Dreyer, the original voice of Lucy. And so, how old would you be here? I would be a teenager. Uh, I'm going to UCSD at that time. I'm about 19 years old, and uh, Phyllis George hosted that show. I don't know if you remember her, but she did the first NFL, and she was Miss America, and she married Tyson Foods, and she drove me an autograph to the best-looking Charlie Brown I've ever met. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's interesting. I mean, we we associate him, of course, so closely because he created these characters. But when it came to the animated specials, he wasn't as hands on because he was doing the comic strip, and he certainly wasn't supervising the voice acting. So you're saying you didn't meet him until you, it was ten years after you had done it, right? Yeah. I mean, he wrote the scripts, though. Right? Yeah. I mean, he wrote a he Charlie created Brown the character. Christmas. Yeah. He wrote it's the Great Pumpkin. Um, you mentioned Bill Melendez. We talked about him a little bit before. He worked uh, on uh, Pinocchio, Fantasia, Dumbo, uh, Bambi, and Warner Brothers cartoons. Um, you, you speak very fondly of him. Uh, what, uh, what can you tell us? What other uh, memories do you have of him? Oh, look, I got my little uh, porn star uh, <laughs> mustache there. Well, uh, it's not as good as his, though. Maybe, maybe yeah. a police officer would be better. This is, uh, it says from 1985, this was uh, Chris Ingalls, so this is the second voice of uh, Charlie Brown is in there with you. And, uh, right, that's, so that's the, the um, motion picture, the first motion picture lineup, a boy named Charlie Brown. And a young Lee Mendelson. This is a guy, Lee Mendelson, that produced this show when he was 36 years old. It's really a remarkable feat. He had known, uh, he grew up in the Bay Area and um, knew Vince Guaraldi and Charles Schultz and brought Bill Melendez in. And um, those are the geniuses behind the special. I'm just uh, a blockhead. The, uh, the movie, so that was a reunion for it. The movie came out in 69, so that was a 1985 reunion. Uh, this was a big screen motion picture, came out uh, around Christmas time, um, 1969. Charlie Brown goes to New York City to, to do a spelling bee. Right. He can't spell his dog's name, Beagle. This was, uh, it was a hit. It grossed $12 million, um, and this was the last time you did uh, the voice of Charlie Brown. That's right. And do you have strong memories about, like, did you bring friends to go see it in the theater? Did you see it more than once? I mean, what was that like? It was just, um, 
it was just a, another job. Really? You know, I enjoyed signing the autographs for the first time. You know, I got to be very anonymous because unless you tell somebody you're the voice of Charlie Brown, they don't really know. When you went to school, you went to a California school. I'm guessing there were a lot of other uh, kids there that maybe had acted or were in families with actors. I'm, I'm guessing it was, uh, you know, that entertainment is, is everywhere there. It wasn't, it wasn't as unusual as it would be if you were going to school, you know, here or in other parts of the country. Well, I actually went to school in Newport Beach. Mm -hmm. So it was um, quite isolated from the... Uh, the movie scene, okay, but everybody came from a, a pretty good wealthy background. How did you really get into this, though? You obviously had to have a mother that really wanted to help you do this and had to be super supportive to be able to get to all these auditions and to get to all these recordings. I followed in my uh, sister's uh, footsteps. Her name was Anna Capri, and her... I don't know, claim to fame was being in that movie, The Enter the Dragon. I don't know if anybody's seen that. But uh, she brings in all the call girls to the different combatants, and she confronts John Saxon and goes, pick one. And he goes, I already have. And she goes, wise decision. <laughs> so... Um, I got to follow in her footsteps. She was in a lot of TV shows, and she was one of the most beautiful women in the world, and my mother happened to be one of the most beautiful women in the world. So that's kind of uh, a good team to have uh, because um, people that are producing movies uh, know that the mother is going to be on the set, and they don't want to have some uh, stage mother nuisance on the set. But my mother... Um, was a charmer. She was from uh, Budapest, Hungary. My father was from Budapest, Hungary, was a very famous uh, doctor in, in uh, Los Angeles. Um, and um, I, I just want to say again that I'm so thankful and grateful to be here, to be able to sit in front of you and talk about these things. Um, because there are way too many people in prison. There are way too many mentally ill people in prison. And I just want to say, if you know a loved one that has bipolar disorder, don't let it go unnoticed or untreated. Yeah. Because in the span of a month, my life disintegrated. And I'm a good guy. And... Uh, it still happened, and um, there's there's support out there, and um, I'm happy to say that today I feel good to be alive, and I'm so proud to be the voice of Charlie Brown. Thank you. I think I think you're absolutely right. Mental health awareness is a is a big thing. I mean, I've certainly uh, known people with that condition. Um, and, and I knew you before that. We had talked, uh, we had done an interview maybe a year before that. Um, and it's just so great that you're here. And it is true, if people, you know, check in on your family members. See how, if, you know, if somebody is, you know, needs some help, try to get them it. So I think that's, a, I think it's a wonderful message. We do have time for a couple more questions, if anybody has any. Yes, over here, what's your name? Cody, what's your question? It was fabulous because you get to have a little fantasy on playing in a movie. You know, a movie you'll, you'll run on, sometimes you'll do it for six weeks and you're in the movie two minutes. People are going, what, what, what the hell were you doing for six weeks? You know, you get cut out and, or whatever. But it's a fantasy for me. I mean, I was an F troop, Get Smart, Gunsmoke, Dragnet, FBI. I can't even remember. My mother would cart me in to play a nine-year-old OD kid in um, Dragnet. In other words, work begot work, and it's not easy because depending on where you live, if you want to be an actor, you got to live in Los Angeles or Hollywood, Santa Monica, you know, 
somewhere in the hood because that's where the studios are. But if you if you have the inclination to do it, um, I think it's a great business to be in. This is uh, from Good Times. This was you and Sonny and Cher. You have a shootout with uh, Sonny Bono. This is unbelievable. I'm on a movie set with Sonny and Cher. The studio bought them his and her Mustangs, pink. I'm sitting there with Cher, and we're listening to one of the rock AM stations, because that's what they had back then. And I Got You, Babe, is playing. And I'm like stoked. I go, I got you, babe. And she's going, turn that crap off. <laughs> And I met Sonny Bono later when he was, uh, I was living in Palm Springs working for a classic rock station. And he was mayor of Palm Springs. Okay. You remember that? So I went up to him, I go, I'm Peter Robbins, I was in a movie with you called Bang Bang. And he goes, and you were a marvelous young actor. And I go, what are you running for office? <laughs> you know, he's like, I'm in the movie a minute. But at any rate, it was a wonderful experience. Sonny Bono, what a tragic way, you know. Yeah. Everybody leaves too soon, in my opinion. He had a skiing accident, and then his other wife took over as mayor of Palm Springs. And uh, But I have uh, nothing but fond memories working for them. Uh, I was uh, blessed to have the most beautiful uh, actresses play my mother. And... Um, there's a lot of, um, I, 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 I worked with a couple of people, uh, Gig Young, I don't know if you remember him, yeah. but um, he was in many motion pictures. Um, he died of suicide, and, yeah. and a woman um, called Jean Seberg, who was probably one of the most beautiful women in the world, and I was in a movie with her called Moment to Moment, filmed in France, directed by Mervyn Leroy, who did Wizard of Oz. Yeah. And uh, she committed suicide as well. Yeah. And it's such a tragedy. Um, you know, but that happens in every business. Uh, um, you know, I asked a friend of mine, my father used to tell me, if you have five good friends in your life, you're lucky. Guy, how many friends do you have that love you? I would say, I mean, literally, it's probably about three, three or four, you know, I mean, that's, right. that are really close outside of family and even that, you know. And I got a thousand friends on Facebook. <laughs> And I love each and every one of them, but I'll never talk to them. But so that, that's just the, the power, not, not of me. That's, that's the power of Charlie Brown. If I, if I get a friend request, I go, I can't believe it. I got a friend request from all over the country. And, and some of them say, like, hello, handsome. So I'm thinking, how much is this going to cost me? 